emotional address with Jonathan Sandberg was given on January 21st, 2014. I should start by saying I will probably likely cry. I'm a therapist. I can't help it. That's what I do. But in my defense, I bet there's no one on campus that looks more like Bronco Mendenhall than I do. <laughs> and we all know he is very manly. So wait for the hat and super serious stare and see what I mean. <laughs> when we first moved to Utah, two of our children were walking around campus and they saw Bronco. Our then 13-year-old daughter said, Dad, you do look just like him, minus the muscles. <clears throat> Notwithstanding my emotional or physical condition during this talk, please remember as I speak today, it is never about the messenger. It's about the message. I pray I can remember what Martin Luther King Jr. said to himself before his first speech at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Keep Martin Luther King in the background and God in the foreground and everything will be all right. Remember, you are a channel of the gospel and not its source. On that note, I want you to know how much I'm humbled by this opportunity. I have tremendous respect for the BYU devotional experience. I have for years read, listened to, and benefited from BYU devotionals. I keep a long list of talks in a file that I give out to clients, family members, friends, and young adults just like you. I've seen many times that healing, hope, and peace can come through the Word of God. Or as Jacob said, the pleasing word of God can heal the wounded soul. For that reason, I felt that perhaps the most helpful thing I could do is simply to provide a list of resources at the end of this talk. I hope these references will help you, your family, your friends, your bishops, therapists, as we all try to deal with the adversities of life and find healing. I've organized those references by topic, for example, adversity, anxiety, pornography use, same gender attraction. And I've listed the talks, most often BYU devotionals, that might be helpful to some reader in the future. Throughout this talk, I will reference many different authors and highlight additional reading that may be helpful for those who are interested. Please take the time to read through the endnotes. I know that healing can be found as we listen to and read words of wisdom and apply true principles found therein. That brings me to today's topic, healing. We all need healing. For some of us, that need is great today. There are likely among us those who are brokenhearted because a relationship has ended badly. Others are in pain because parents have, their parents have decided to divorce or a loved one has renounced the church. Some have learned recently they have a chronic illness and others have just relapsed into addictive behavior for what seems like the hundredth time. I would guess there are some today who have wondered if depression or anxiety will always be a suffocating influence in their lives, while other students are going through a loss that seems both unfair and unrelenting. Others are drowning in loneliness and isolation, while still others are constantly placed on the margins, even here at BYU. Perhaps these folks look or talk or feel different from what might be considered the norm. This group is broader than we think, and it often includes new converts to the church, those who experience same-gender attraction, those who are fortunate enough to have diversity in their ethnic, racial, or cultural background, or those who do not like to sing songs about eternal and happy families, because that has not been their experience. Even the greatest among us, Jesus Christ, experienced betrayal, mocking, abandonment, loss of loved ones, and physical pain as part of his mortal experience. My hope today is to encourage you that healing is possible if you apply the principles that lead to healing. I will try to explain clearly, and I ask for your prayers that we can understand one another by the Spirit, three principles that can lead to healing, knowing that all healing is a gift from Jesus Christ. For as Isaiah said, with his stripes we are healed. My talk is entitled, Healing Equals Courage Plus Action Plus Grace. And in honor of Martin Luther King Jr., who was recently listed in Ted Stewart's The Mark of a Giant as one of seven people who changed the world, I start with an example from his life that so clearly highlights these principles. Look for courage, action, and grace as I read his words. Quote, almost immediately after the bus boycott started, we began to receive threatening telephone calls and letters. They increased as time went on. One night I couldn't sleep. It seemed all of my fears had come down on me at once. I had heard these things before. 
But for some reason, that night it got to me. I went to the kitchen, and I sat there and thought about a beautiful little daughter who had just been born. I started thinking about a dedicated and loyal wife who was over there asleep, and she could be taken from me, or I could be taken from her. And I got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think I'm right. I'm taking a stand for what I believe is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage. Now I'm afraid. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. I tell you, I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still fight on. He promised never to leave me alone. And at that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I'd never experienced him before. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. Could you see the pathway to healing? Courage to face a difficult situation and stand for truth. Acting in faith by turning to God in prayer and peace and strength from the Lord through his grace. Courage, action, grace. What then is healing and why should we seek it? My favorite talk on the subject of healing is a BYU devotional given by Elaine Marshall in 2002, entitled Learning the Healer's, Healer's Art. I strongly recommend you study it. I assign it in every class I teach, from undergraduate to doctoral level. I suggest you read it more than once. Listen closely to her definition of healing. On that first day as a nurse, I assumed cure, care, and healing to be synonymous. I've learned they're not the same. Healing is not cure. Cure is clean, quick, and done, often under anesthesia. Healing, however, is often a lifelong process of recovery and growth in spite of, or maybe because of, enduring physical, emotional, or spiritual assault. It requires time. It requires all the energy of your entire being. You have to be there fully awake, aware, and participating when it happens. Healing is much more than getting better or having your problems go away. Healing is growth, development, maturing. In a word, healing is change. It takes time and energy and struggle. But healing teaches us. As Marshall said, healing can help us to become more sensitive and awake to life. Healing invites the gifts of humility and faith. It opens our hearts to truth, beauty, and grace. But remember, even with all that beauty and growth and grace, healing does hurt. Some people I've had the privilege of working with over the years have had a hard time reconciling the fact that healing requires suffering, and yet it is a gift from the Savior. How is it that a loving God would allow us to suffer? I've come to realize that my Savior cares more about my growth than he does my comfort. One evidence of his love is that he does not spare me from the suffering I need for my development and progression, even when I get mad at him. As a client once told me, I used to feel guilty for getting mad at God. Then I realized he can handle it. And unlike other humans, he does not punish me when I'm mad or hold a grudge or remind me of it the next time my heart is right and I ask help, ask for his help. I love how Elder Dallin H. Oaks, who is a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the LDS Church, describes healing. Healing blessings come in many ways, each suited for our individual needs, as known to him who loves us best. Sometimes the healing lifts our burden, but sometimes we are healed by, be given, by given strength or understanding or patience to bear the burdens placed upon us. As we consider the key components for healing, let us remember that in the end, healing is a gift from our Savior that will likely require effort and suffering on our part so we can grow and develop through our struggles. This gift is often the refinement we experience in the process. Let me give you one example from one of my heroes. When the relatively young Nelson Mandela first entered prison, he was described by his peers as too emotional, meaning he lacked self-control, passionate, meaning he had a temper, and quickly stung, meaning he was easily offended. But when he left prison 27 years later, he was described as balanced, measured, and controlled. 
As Richard Stengel noted in his excellent book on lessons learned from Mandiba, Nelson Mandela had many teachers in his life, but the greatest of all was prison. When pestered about how prison had changed him, Mandela simply said, I came out mature. Was prison a healing experience for Mandela? It depends on how you describe healing. In Elder Oak's words, Mandela developed in prison the strength, understanding, and patience necessary to bear the burdens that were placed on him. What were those burdens? Mandela left prison to lead two groups in the midst of decades of violent and hate-filled conflict into miraculously peaceful development of a democracy and prevent the loss of hundreds of thousands of life, lives in a civ bloody civil war. Is that healing? I would say yes. Mandela's personal healing fostered nationwide healing. His life is an example of how courage, action, and grace lead to healing. Now let's shift for a moment to focus on courage. Simply defined, courage, true courage, is not the absence of fear, but the willingness to proceed in spite of it. In order for healing to occur, we have to be courageous enough to move forward, even when we're afraid. I've chosen three examples where courage is needed for healing to occur. First, we have to be courageous enough to face the truth regarding what needs to change in our lives. This type of intense introspection requires tremendous honesty with ourselves. As Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But that is usually only after it hurts us first. Most of what I know about the courage to heal I've learned from clients. I've noticed among those who find healing a real commitment to learning the truth about themselves, which is never easy. I once asked a client if he really wanted to change. If he wanted to change badly enough to hear the truth about his role in his marriage, he said yes. So I told him I thought he was a diva who interacts with his wife from a selfish and entitled place. I was impressed with his response to me. After a chuckle, he said, you're probably right, and I don't want to be a diva anymore. I want someone to call me out on my stuff, and I want to change. He was back the next week, ready to work. I appreciated his courage. It takes courage to be honest with ourselves. Second, it takes tremendous courage to be congruent, to live a life where our public and private priorities are in sync, where what we experience on the inside is consistent with what we show on the outside. I like what marriage and family therapist Bill Doherty said about integrity. He said, integrity is harmony between our moral beliefs and our actions. I learned this lesson the hard way when a colleague at Syracuse University gave me some pointed and painful feedback. After one faculty meeting, he said to me, it must be exhausting being you, living a two-faced life. When I asked him what he meant, he explained, I cannot believe the guy I see at work who seems to say anything that will help him fit into the group he is with is the same guy that attends church on Sunday. A little context may help with this story. I was hired at Syracuse as a 28-year-old recent graduate, a white male conservative Christian working in a liberal social activist program. Unfortunately, my colleague was correct. I definitely wanted to fit in, and I was unsure about what I really thought and felt regarding socially and politically intense topics like same-gender marriage. I was posing and pretending to try to fit in. As James in the New Testament said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. His feedback became more personal for both me and him as he went on to say, look, as a black man, if the KKK came to town, I know you would hide me in your basement. But as soon as they came to your door, you would turn me over to save yourself. In essence, my colleague was saying, I do not trust you because you do not have the courage to be congruent in all settings. It took time for me to internalize that feedback and realize he was right. I had to figure out what I believed, not what my parents believed, not what the church said was right or my employer, but what I believed was right. I had to get right between God and me. Then I had to learn to live congruently, where my actions were in harmony with my moral beliefs, which took courage. But oh, how refreshing it is to live a life of integrity. Healing requires the courage to find out what we believe is true and live according to that truth. As the therapist Brene Brown has astutely observed, trying to co-op co-opt or win someone over is always a mistake. It means trading in your authenticity for approval. You stop believing in your worthiness and start hustling for it. 
I've learned over the years that posturing, posing, peacocking, and pretending are exhausting and bring unhappiness. Having the courage to be congruent brings a settled and peaceful feeling. I like what Elijah in the Old Testament said about congruence. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. Third, we have to develop the courage to live counter to the world's dominant culture. You know what I'm talking about. The culture where money, sex, material possessions, fame, violent exploits, and violent behavior and carnal exploits are the currency for success. We live in a world where appearance and approval are the keys to social status and power. In order to find healing, we have to develop the courage to say no to the dominant culture. I love what Maury Schwartz says to Mitch Albom about living counterculture in the book Tuesdays with Maury. The culture we have does not make people feel good about themselves. We're teaching the wrong things. And you have to be strong enough to say, if the culture doesn't work, don't buy it. Create your own. A number of wonderful BYU devotionalists have described the unhealthy culture of perceived perfectionism and how we have to fight against it. In two devotionals given just last semester, both Tyler Jarvis and Kristen Matthews have encouraged us to be more accepting of our imperfections, to be more pleased with our best approximations, our bodies, our gifts, our differences. I encourage you to reread their talks. Listen to what Thomas S. Monson, president of the LDS Church, said about having the courage to live by truth and to avoid the unhealthy dominant culture. Let us have the courage to de defy consensus, the courage to stand up for principle. Courage, not compromise, brings a smile of God's approval. A moral coward is one who is afraid to do what she or he thinks is right because others will disapprove or laugh. In her delightful way, author and devoted mother and grandmother Marjorie Pay Hinckley describes the peace that comes when we refuse to compare and despair, as the dominant culture teaches. Quote, 50 was my favorite age. It takes about that long to quit competing and to be yourself and settle down to living. It is the age I would like to be throughout eternity. In order to find healing, we have to develop the courage to avoid the culture that says there is only one way, i.e., a specific size, hair color, ACT score, to be a good person or even a good Christian. There are many, many ways to be a righteous, positive influence in the world. If enough of us say no to the dominant culture, it will lose its power. This brings us to the next part of the equation. Courage plus action plus grace equals healing. Action is essential to healing. To act instead of merely being acted upon was a key issue in the war of heaven before we came to this earth. According to the scriptures, God gave unto man and woman that they should act for themselves. But Satan sought to destroy the agency of man. When pondering these scriptures, I realized that when I choose to be inactive or place myself in a state of being acted upon, I give Satan greater power in my life. A number of scriptures describe clearly the need to act and not be acted upon. But how is action related to healing? I've come to see that action is the point where belief turns into faith. When we act in faith, moving ahead on a good path, we open the door to grace. Courage to act opens the door to grace, which is the key to healing. Learning to act in faith is one of the great challenges of mortality. What then are the major roadblocks to acting in faith? I would like to suggest procrastination and fear are two of Satan's greatest tools to keep us in the acted upon position. If Satan can convince us that our fear is too great to be able to act, or that to act is a great idea, but to do it later, he can prevent us from opening the door to grace. Think about how he does this. Maybe you tell yourself, I totally plan on getting married. It's a great idea. In fact, I'm pro-marriage. But I do have these other things I have to do first. Or, my life is in a holding pattern right now. I'm not sure where I should go or what I should do until I get married. I'm stuck. Or, I know I have this problem, insert pornography use, eating patterns, anxiety, and it needs to be fixed. But I have too much to do right now to put the time and energy into addressing it. Or, I cannot go to my bishop to resolve this sin because I'm afraid he will see how far I've fallen and he will not want to or not be able to help me. Can you see how effective procrastination and fear are in meeting the Satan's objectives in our lives? 
Remember, the longer we remain in an inactive state, the farther we drift from the Lord and his spirit. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. The more often a person feels without acting, the less he will be able ever to act. And in the long run, the less he will be able to feel. How then can we overcome the tendency to procrastinate or shut down in fear? May I propose that prayer is the simplest form of action. Remember the truth in this hymn, prayer can change the night to day. So when life gets dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When you pray, you act in faith and open the door to blessings that God is already willing to grant, but that are made conditional upon your asking. In your prayers, be sure to speak openly, sincerely, and directly to him who is your heavenly father. Sometimes I fear our prayers are too vague and too passive to bring about the spiritual support we need. We need to learn how to offer mighty prayer. For example, you may fervently plead, Heavenly Father, I'm procrastinating again. I'm getting stuck in that old pattern. Please help me to break free. Please give me the strength to just get started and then the stamina to stick with the task. Or, Heavenly Father, I'm totally shut down in fear. I need to move forward and act, but this prayer is all I can muster up right now. Please help me find the courage to act. I promise those prayers will be heard and help will come. We call that help grace. And remember, you can still act even if you are afraid or you feel like procrastinating. My favorite example of this type of action is Mother Teresa. I love this quote about her from writer Marcus Goodyear. Mother Teresa doubted, her spirit wavered, some days she questioned herself, some days she questioned God. And this is the biggest encouragement of all. Even Mother Teresa had doubts. Her, doubts, her doubt gives me hope, not that my own doubt will go away, but that feelings of doubt are not as powerful as a faithful decision to act. I may doubt, but I still pray. I, may, I still go to church, I still worship. Doubt is a feeling, but faith chooses to act no matter our feelings. Another great example of acting in the face of understandable fear is Rosa Parks. Over the last three years, I've had the privilege of co-teaching a civil rights course and visiting historical sites central to the civil rights movement. One of my favorite sites to visit is the Rosa Parks Museum. Mrs. Parks is known for her courageous stand on a bus where she refused to give up her seat. Until visiting her museum and reading more about her life, I did not realize that numerous African Americans had been beaten, arrested, raped, or shot in Montgomery during the decade before her refusal to give up her seat, all for taking a similar stance to Mrs. Parks. In my study of her, I've learned that Mrs. Parks was courageously acting long before that winter day in 1955. For example, she served as a secretary in the local chapter of the NAACP and was a vigorous advocate for justice for black women who had been br brutally raped in the South. However, as will be our experience, most of her courageous acts were unknown and unheralded. In the case of the bus boycott, she was in the right place at the right time, willing to do the right thing, which helped bring needed change to our country. I have since asked myself more than once, Am I in the right place, doing the right thing, willing to act as God prompts so I can do the work he has given me? Listen to how one biographer describes Mrs. Parks' courage to act. Parks made an active choice in that instance. In a moment designed to fright, frighten and degrade, she was able to see herself as an agent and claim a space of choice. I love that phrase, see herself as an agent and claim a space of choice. When we have the courage to act, we open the door to healing, as Mrs. Park's courageous act opened the door to the civil rights movement, a movement that brought a large measure of needed healing to this country. This brings us to the final part of our equation. Healing equals courage plus action plus grace. What is grace? I love the definition provided by David A. Bednar, then president of BYU-Idaho, in a similar devotional. He quotes the LDS Bible Dictionary, which states that grace can be defined as divine means of help or strength given through the bounteous mercy and love of Jesus Christ. 
It is likewise through the grace of the Lord that individuals receive strength and assistance to do good works that they otherwise would not be able to maintain if left to their own means. This grace is an enabling power. Thus, the enabling power of the Atonement strengthens us to do and be good and serve beyond our own individual desire national, natural capacity. The scriptures are full of examples of the grace of Jesus Christ as he ministers to people who are struggling to do and be good but are coming up short. They teach of him reaching out to his people at their breaking point and providing, and these are all quotes, strength, patience, joy, comfort, assurances, peace, faith, hope, courage, determination, and even wiping away the tears from their eyes. The grace of Jesus Christ, his bounteous love and mercy, is available to us if we but have the courage to reach out to him. Sometimes that grace comes directly through the Holy Ghost, and we can feel his clear and specific love for us. Sometimes that grace comes as Christ touches another person's heart and prompts her or him to share, bless, and uplift another. In other words, grace is often made manifest through the courage and action of a person who reaches out to serve another. Let me give you a touching example of this principle of reaching out from the childhood of Thomas S. Monson, the president of the LDS Church. Quote, again, Christmas time had come. We were preparing the oven for a gigantic turkey and anticipating a savory feast that awaited. A neighborhood pal of mine asked a startling question. What does turkey taste like? I responded, oh, about like chicken tastes. Again, a question, what does chicken taste like? It was then I realized my friend had never eaten chicken or turkey. I asked what his family was going to have for Christmas dinner. There was no prompt response, just a downcast glance and a comment, I don't know, there's nothing in the house. I pondered a solution. There was none. I had no turkeys, no chickens, no money. Then I remembered I did have two pet, pet rabbits. Immediately I took them to my friend and handed the box to him with a comment. Here, take these two rabbits. They're good to eat. Ch just like chicken. He took the box, climbed the fence, and headed for home. At Christmas dinner, safely assured. Tears came easily to me as I closed the door to the empty rabbit hutch, but I was not sad. A warmth, a feeling of indescribable joy filled my heart. It was a memorable Christmas. President Monson was a minister of grace. We can be one too. Grace is the power by which healing occurs. In every aspect of his mortal and post-mortal ministry, Christ went about healing all manner of afflictions. His part is to be our atoning savior. Our part is to be courageous enough to act and then he provides the grace and healing. However, sometimes we, we may not appreciate the manifestations of his grace because healing blessings do not always come in the form we asked. Sometimes his grace is made manifest by letting us sit and struggle with an issue. Again, our Heavenly Father and Savior are more interested in our growth and progression than they are in our comfort and convenience. These moments of struggle often bring the greatest growth. Permit me to illustrate this point with an example from the life of my sweetheart and best friend, Sharon. In April of 2002, Sharon's 56-year-old father, Mike, suffered a major heart attack one day at work. As a result of lack of oxygen to the brain, he was in a coma for a week. Many friends and family members prayed and fasted. He received multiple blessings. His name was placed on the prayer roll at multiple temples. But regardless of these efforts, it was his time to die. As the months passed, we came to some measure of peace regarding his early and unexpected death. At the time, Sharon was working with the young children in our church as the primary president. It was her turn to teach the children, and the topic assigned was, God hears and answers prayers. We talked a lot about that lesson and the dilemma it presented for her. She said, I know God hears and answers our prayers, but if in the end he's going to do what is his will, why should I pray for what I want and need? My dad died anyway because it was God's will. My prayers have not been the same since he died. If you've not yet experienced that kind of despair in your prayers, you likely will. For some of you, that moment is now. 
So what did Sharon teach the children? Up until the night before, she was not sure what to say. When the day came, she simply taught through her tears. I know that God hears and answers every prayer. He does not always give us the answer we want, and that really hurts. But I believe you'll do better in your life by praying than by not praying. That is why I pray every day. Acting on true principles, even when your heart says otherwise, takes true courage. As a result, Sharon received a measure of healing that day through the grace of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite parts about being married to Sharon and there are many, is to listen to her pray in faith for our children, extended family, and others in need. She knows how to talk to Heavenly Father. As my friend Ty Mansfield has described in one of the stories profiled on the church's website, mormonsandgays.org, if we can just stay with God, trust Him, and keep doing the things that bring the Spirit into our lives, then light and healing can enter in, even though at the moment things look dark and gloomy. Whether the struggle is same-gender attraction, a crisis of faith, an addiction, or a deep sense of loneliness, just stay with God. Trust Him. There is light and love ahead. Again, if we can muster up the courage and take action, Christ provides the grace. Courage plus action plus grace equals healing. By way of conclusion and testimony, I know that Jesus Christ is the great healer. Over many years, in numerous settings, I have seen wounds of horrific abuse, long-standing addiction, loss that has shattered the soul, and heartache beyond description be addressed, overcome, and resolved through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I know He is real. He is a living and loving God. I love and honor Him. I know His grace is sufficient, meaning it is big or powerful enough to help us with all of our problems. I know His promises to us are real and true. He can and will cleanse and heal us, as He has said, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with Jonathan Sandberg was given on January 21st, 2014.